some bikes are so well loved, so respected, so important even, that they gain something of a cult following. Hayabusa, Fireblade, 916, Fizzy, that last one will get some of the youngsters out there frowning a bit. And it's noticeable that a lot of these bikes, but by no means all of them, obviously, have got names rather than numbers. Well, here's another one, Monster. And it measures up in all the right places to be cultish. It's often regarded as the first purpose-built modern naked sport bike. It has the respect of punters all over the world, 350,000 of them in fact. And given that number and the time that it first arrived on the scene back in 1993, it has often been touted as the saviour of Ducati. I have a friend who is a mad monster aficionado and is most proud of his S4 RS, one of the later spicy versions, and there are many more like him. And like him, a lot of them have had their Ducatisti noses put out of joint by this new model. The reason? Well, if you're looking at a monster, one of the first things you normally see, apart from a ruddy great V-twin, is a collection of metal tubes, often, though not always, red in colour. They form the frame of the motorcycle. Where are they? Well, they're gone. And in their place, Ducati has seen fit to bring some technology that it developed while pottering around doing a bit of racing in a championship called MotoGP. They've been doing rather well these last few years, and so you might assume that gratitude would be the major emotion upon perusing this minimalistic aluminium Panigale-inspired technology. Ah, oh, no. No, 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 no. Not a bit of it. Many of the connoisseurs of the monster consider this more than a little heretical, and many stern words have been uttered, most of them on forums, which are of course known to bring about the best, most reasonable points of view. Well... <laughs> To all that, is what I say. We move with the times, and if Ducati think improvements can be had by making this change, I'm all for it. Let's try and cut through the fog of online words that are currently clouding the discussions of this new model, and the easiest way to do that is to go for a ride. Well, I say easiest, what I actually mean is scariest. An early morning ride while the fog clears means there's still damp patches under the trees and as of right now, in my underpants. OK, OK, TMI, but you'd understand if you were here because along with the temperature and the moisture there is the small factor of the state of the Italian road network. Before I get too carried away with my ride, Allow me to demonstrate, because in places it can be really quite smooth, predictable and really rather grippy. But then it can change literally between corners or even in the middle of a corner into something a little more rough and ready. Or it might go completely retro and offer up more cracks and holes and frightening falls than a night out in the seediest part of Rome. Putting all that aside, as much as humanly possible, the first thing to strike you about this new model is its more manageable size. The old bike used to have a kind of weird long stretch across to the handlebar, so it actually felt quite big. This, the handlebar is much closer to the rider. And so it feels much smaller, much less in oh, <laughs> much less intimidating, and as a result, just more manageable, more agile. The riding position is indeed significantly changed, by which I mean significantly better. The handlebar is both closer and higher, and the foot pegs have also been moved back and down giving your legs an easier time of it. Losing the trellis frame has also made the bike narrower and so effectively reducing the seat height at the same time. 
If your legs still aren't long enough, then no worries, because there's a lower seat and even a suspension lowering kit that should cater for the shortest of inside leg measurements. You do lean forward slightly, but in a good way. It's by no means a committed sport riding position, but by the same token, you do feel in the right body position to move around the bike when you want to start going a bit mental on your favourite back roads. Along with the actual physical reduction in size, there's a reduction in the overall weight of the bike compared to the previous model, the nearest one, which would have been the 821 Monster. In fact, it saves a grand total of 18 kilos over that bike, thanks to weight losses in things like the wheels, a lot has come off the engine, and the new frame. There's an advantage of not having a trellis frame. That saved quite a few kilos as well. So you can actually feel it quite easily moving the bike around. It feels light, and when you're ready to go for a ride, just hoiking it off the side stand, so easy. Like that a lot. And it's also noticeable when you're trying to dodge the dodgiest bits of dodginess on your favourite bit of Italian dream road. Because you can alter line more easily and generally just throw the bike around without too much in the way of muscle power kind of handy for me. The lack of weight also means that it recovers a lot more quickly from a series of awkward bumps. Although some of that is undoubtedly down to the capable suspension. You'll notice that I said capable and not excellent or brilliant or amazing. That's because it's pretty good for an everyday kind of naked bike. But I must admit some of these bumps definitely made me bottom out the rear shock. And although the front end is generally very good, I wouldn't have minded the ability to be able to dial in some more compression damping or maybe even a touch of spring preload on the 43 millimeter upside down forks. But I can't because the forks are unadjustable. That's not to say they aren't good, because they are. And I know that because I'm not lying dead and battered at the foot of one of these cliffs that I'm riding next to. Still, it's this kind of cost cutting that says this is very much a street bike for the masses. And if you want a more track ready or outright sporty monster, you can splash a bit more cash and get yourself the 1200 while it's still on sale, or maybe wait a couple of months and go the Street Fighter V2 route. One thing that was never gonna change was the use of a V-twin. That would have been far too sacrilegious. So we've got the good old Tester Stretta, the same unit that's in the Hyper Motard 950, the Super Sport, and even the Multistrada V2. And here in the Monster, it feels well suited to the naked bike rule. In the state of tune in which we find the 937cc V-twin here, there's 111 horsepower and 93 newton meters of torque. And that puts it in the right place to deal with its obvious competitors from Austria, Germany, Japan, and the UK. It's plenty, <laughs> it's plenty punchy enough off the bottom end, fit through the mid range. It's just, the top third of the revs, where it feels perhaps just a little breathless. But it works well mated to this very good two-way quick shifter, which obviously, as always, works, as they all do, really well at high RPM. It's just when you're trickling around through traffic or you've got a passenger that you probably just want to finesse the throttle and the clutch the old-fashioned way 
just get a bit more of a smooth ride that way. This might be Ducati's most affordable road bike if you ignore the scramblers, but that doesn't mean they've skimped on the electronic rider aids. You get a legible 4.3 inch TFT color screen and an easy set of buttons for swapping between the three riding modes and assorted other options. Those modes adjust throttle responsiveness, traction control, cornering ABS, wheelie control and rear wheel lift. And in urban mode, it chops the power to 75 horsepower, which means it's less of a monster and more of a pussycat. Truth be told, I've pretty much left it in sport mode like I always do, because the throttle response is still plenty manageable enough while you're trickling along through villages or admiring the scenery. Talking of which, now I'm out of the woods, so to speak. I think I need to sit down to this lake that I can just spy through the buildings and finish this test. Is this a good middleweight naked bike capable of being everything from a commuter to a sport bike? Yes, yes it is. And on the face of it, this new model is better at those jobs than the model it replaces. It feels significantly lighter, more agile, more responsive on a blast through the countryside. And that can only be a good thing. Is it still a monster in the way it always was? Well, no, obviously. Its character has undoubtedly changed. That may upset a few old crusties, but for those new to the biking game, for those considering a middleweight naked bike for the first time, the changes are undoubtedly for the better. However, this is a more competitive class than it's ever been. And although it is very affordable for a Ducati, it faces some stiff competition from a variety of contenders for your naked cash. Before we get to that though, I've got the small matter of a four hour ride back to the Ducati factory in Bologna. Once that's out of the way, we'll consider those other bikes and I'll point out a few extra things that I did and didn't like about this next stage in the evolution of Ducati's monster. As is always the case, spending more time riding the bike reveals more about it and the stuff that's irritating gets more so, but also the good stuff shines through. Extra good stuff I didn't mention in the test is the attractive headlight where the running light basically runs around its circumference. And then there's the even cooler scrolling indicators, rather Audi like which I suppose isn't too surprising given its ownership of Ducati. I was quite impressed with the long distance comfort as well. I was on the plus version that gives you a pillion seat cover and the small wind deflector thing for an extra 4,000 Rand or so. I didn't think the wind protection was too bad at all for a properly naked bike. However, having not ridden the standard version, I can't really say whether that's down to the little wind deflector or not. Interestingly, and quite unusually these days, there's no steering damper, but it doesn't need one. You saw the state of the roads I was playing on and I never got any head shake, so fair enough. I also enjoy the fact that you can remove the ABS from the rear wheel so you can be a delinquent and skid away to your heart's content and practice trying to back it into the corners. Don't blame me though when you uh, mini high side yourself into an expensive insurance claim, but I do genuinely like the fact that like KTM, they at least give you the choice. Stuff I'm not quite so keen on is a relatively small 14 litre tank that could well see you hunting for fuel not much after 200 k's if you're thrashing it like, um, well, like all sporting Ducati should be thrashed. I'm also not keen on the fact that the tank gets its shape from some plastic cowls either side of the metal tank itself, but that's just a personal aesthetic assessment. I'd prefer a full one piece tank. But that is a pretty minor gripe. There's a few bare wires and a bit too much in the way of flimsy plastic covers on the engine, which I suppose is understandable because it's a water-cooled lump that was never designed to be seen, really. Still, there's no getting away from the fact it's not pretty. The best thing to do would be to get yourself a 
funky belly pan that would hide a few of the scruffy bits and at the same time will, I'm sure, improve the frontal side-on looks of the bike quite significantly. Oh, and while I'm at it, the twin exhausts are okay looking from the side and from a distance, although the finish does look disappointingly cheap the closer you get. Take a look from the rear though and check those tiny little holes for the exhaust gases. They're the sort of thing you expect to see on a scooter. No two ways about it, they're, um, they're horrible. The looks overall are okay, not too shouty, just staying the right side of bland, I think. Not as distinctive as the offerings from KTM, Triumph and Yamaha in this segment, and sort of on a par with BMW's F900R that I personally think has some good angles, even if it is quite anonymous head on. If you're a traditionalist and still want a trellis frame, then go for the KTM 890 Duke, which works out with all its electronics turned on, just a bit cheaper than the plus version of the monster. Triumph Street Triple R, not the RS, is also a similarly priced alternative, but it's more sporty, less grunty than the Ducati, and it doesn't have a funky TFT screen. The BMW has an amazing electronics package with a brilliant TFT display, but less horsepower and a lot more weight. Yamaha's MT-09 is much more affordable, a fair bit more powerful and is, I think on balance, still the best of the lot when it comes to being fun to ride, but it too shows some signs of cost cutting with some rough edges here and there. And it doesn't have a Ducati badge on the tank of course, and lovely as the triple engine is, it's not a V-twin and the Ducati is the only bike in this class with one of those. So finally, apart from a couple of relatively minor irritations, I'd say the job's a good one. The new monster is fun to ride in town or in the countryside. It's easy to ride for newbies, yet there's plenty there for the more experienced rider as well. And it's affordable enough to be a viable contender for the average Joe in what is a very hotly contested class. And you can't always say that about a Ducati. 216 rand for the base version, add four grand for the plus version or another four grand for the gray or dark model that I rode. Let us know what you think about this new monster. Is it offensive to your Ducatisti love of the original monster? Is it not special enough? Are you interested, but will wait for a more special version to arrive in the future? If you love the more traditional monster attributes, then may I suggest you find yourself a 1200 monster and buy a new one, because I think you can be pretty sure that that will soon be out of production. That will leave just the new 937cc bike, but maybe they'll revive a bigger version with the 1260V twin that recently saw in the Panigale and Multistrada. Too many questions, too few answers. As always, I would advise you not to delay, buy a bike, any bike, get out there and live in the moment because that's what biking does for us. It certainly does it for me. Whatever bike I happen to have for a test, they all do that one thing make me concentrate on the ride to the exclusion of all the other rubbish that normally clutters my tiny little mind. And on that note, time to put on a helmet and do some decluttering, if that's even a word. See you on the next one.